Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective, part five of Never Bring Ignorance to a Debate, dissecting the Larry Elder's interview on The Breakfast Club. Now, before we get into it, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comments section below. All comments are welcome. We are continue our, continuing our deconstruct, our dissecting of this interview with Larry Elders and The Breakfast Club. Now, what is interesting about this interview is, one, Larry is a black conservative who rarely goes on or speaks to black audiences. Um, and I don't know if it's because he's not in, invited, per se. He has been on other shows. I have seen him on other shows. But um, his primary audience when he speaks especially what you hear him the the talking points that he is uh spewing out uh is primarily to white audience in other words he's speaking to white audience about black people um and and, and never ever that he ever criticize white people okay he never never criticized him so um and that has served him well <clears throat> Okay, it has served him well. He has done well in life by having that platform. Now, my <clears throat> title, Never Bring Ignorance to a Debate, is aimed more at the Breakfast Club because if you're going to invite someone on your show, uh, I think you should do your homework. Now, what we have with the Breakfast Club <clears throat> Is Charlemagne the God, and that's his that's his name. Okay, that's what he goes by, and um, DJ Envy. Now that's this is their show. It is a urban hip hop entertainment radio show. Okay, and <clears throat> you can almost put it in the category of a hip hop genre. They cut. They talk about a lot of um, black news, entertainment hip-hop entertainment like that but they also <clears throat> bring on Teslan Figueroa she is more she brings more of the news or analysis to the show so in other words they bring her on uh, to give more news information and this is where I think I, I, I don't think she did as well in responding to um, a lot of the the stuff that Larry was saying, and I thought she should have been better prepared. I don't expect for Charlemagne and DJ uh, to respond to Larry. It's not that they can't. I'm responding by doing simple Google searches, so it's not like they can't. But most people are not really designed or prepared to uh, um, handle debates. Um, respond to information, and especially when it comes to conservatives and their method of delivery. So what they will do, what Larry will do, is <clears throat> he, he he spits out a lot of facts. So typically they he they try to over talk, though they filibuster, and they and they spit out a lot of facts, and some of those facts they have half truths in them but most of the time they uh they're not put in the proper context <clears throat> so i'm taking the time to dissect his arguments now this is his typical talking point argument this is what he's pretty much wherever you see larry uh he, he's going to say the same thing if he's obviously talking to a white audience, a conservative audience, they're going to give him the amen, okay? If he's talking to a progressive audience, they're just not prepared to respond. So let's dissect, let's continue, pick up where we left off. Let's pick up um, dissecting his argument. Here we go. Okay, so we're going to pick this up 
when we left off, um, he, he made some comments about Barack Obama. I, I, I addressed him in part four. So now we're going to kind of really see Tazlan's response to this. Mr. Elder, a quick question. Let's just remove the word racism since that seems to be a word uh, that, that triggers, you know, a, a conversation down the water hole. Let's just focus on the word. I, I'm going to say she should have continued if if you are use if if your platform or your belief is racism my thing is counteract his talking points with your facts on racism but i understand what she's doing here we go or system uh okay. you mentioned that the system uh, was the one that discouraged. And again, we have no problem uh, with agreeing that the, the family, the, the black family should certainly uh, have some room for some improvement. But let's just focus on- Now I'm gonna push back on what she just said right here when she says she agrees with his status in terms of the, the black family. Every group can, can say this. Every group of people fall into this statement. It's just too wide of a brush. Now, when it comes to Black families, Larry is focusing solely on the fact that, in his opinion, the accusation of the absence of black fathers is why blacks are on the bottom of the run. So that would include, include everyone. In other words, if you say, Tesla, that you agree with Larry, then does that mean that your family was messed up? Uh, how about uh, DJ Envy's Charlemagne the God? Are you all families messed up? Are you now also uh, perpetuating the stereotype? No. It, 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 there's In every community, there is a segment of people that is at the bottom of the run. They're poor. They're unruly. Um, they are the sinners of the group, okay? But at the same time, in every group, you have the you have the range of from the very low to the very high, right? To the very poor to the very rich. It's on system. Room for he improvement. Said system. Well, we're not going to go down that water. You, we're okay. not going to go down that water hole. Let's get to the question. So the question is: You said that the system encouraged uh, black women to be single mothers, correct? I said the welfare state. Yes. The welfare, the system. So who's okay. in charge of the system? Who is? Now again, I I, I addressed this before. The system, see again, she's not, to me, holding him to a accountable. The system did not encourage uh, mothers to be single. The system required, in other words, the welfare system required people to be in a state of need. In other words, it didn't. There was no design to say, let's just go after black people and destroy the black community. First of all, it, it failed, if, it, if that's what you're saying, the attempt was. No, the, the, the great society, the development of the welfare system were designed to help the poor, but you had to be poor. You had to qualify to be poor. And you can argue about the administration of the system. As, we, as I said before, white people benefit more from welfare, from food stamps, than any other group. No matter how you want to slice it up, if you want to say, well, they, over, they, you know, they there's more people of them. Well, who cares if you're spending the money? So, um, here we go. Who's in charge of the system? Well, it was Democrats that passed it. And who were the, Democrats? Were they black or white at that time? Well, at the time, majority of black people were Democrats as the majority of black no, no, people no, are Democrats not, now. Not the voters. I'm, I'm talking about the system. Remember the main idea is the word system. Who was in charge? Now, <clears throat> I don't know why Larry is evading saying that white people were in charge of the system, why he wants to continually bring up black people. This is his M.O. In other words, he criticizes right he condemns the democrats he blames the democrats for all the ill but yet even in this he won't say white democrats are the ones who started the system administrated the system i don't know why he's evading that now i also don't know why what tesla's point for bringing this up per se 
but let's hear her out charge of the system at the time the the democrats at the time the system i'm just going to charlemagne's point about white or black was it white democrats in charge of the system or black democrats in well, charge of the system? well if you're prepared to say that lyndon johnson did this <clears throat> viciously with an intent to destroy the black family i disagree he did it with the best of intentions uh, now, and- now this is a deflection she never said that this is deflection she never said that this is why in fact she never even brought up any type of um, motive as to why the system was started. She asked him a very pointed question, and you can see how he's deflecting. This is the this is the his his his, his mo. He's deflecting. I don't understand why he's deflecting. I just don't understand why. And, 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 if you, and if you look at and if you look at the New York Times, which is left wing, mm-hmm. the Washington Post, which is left wing, they cheered all Got of it. this. Right, and what I'm asking was it white people, so I'm gonna ask again in case my mic's not coming through clearly, was it white people in charge of the system or black people in charge of that system that helped break down the black family? It's a simple, yes, just a simple question, white or black? Well, you didn't have to go on welfare unless you voluntarily chose to go on welfare. The inducement was put there uh, by Democrats, uh, by, the, Democrats by, by the left. White Democrats, correct, okay. White well, Democrats, well most, black, most black people were Democrats and they voted for these white people Not too. voters, I said who's in charge? So, Glenn, what's his point of saying that? I mean, really, if you stop and you think about it, what's his point of saying that? It's a deflection. But in the deflection, then are you, and this is what his MO is, it is to deflect from white guilt. It is to deflect from the evils of white people. And I'll be, I'll, let me be clear, some white people. But even the white people he would disagree with he even now seem to be covering for them, okay? And simply say, instead of simply saying, yes, white people are in charge. But in fact, he probably could have done better by saying, you know, but you know, you know, those bad black people took advantage of the system. Okay, I'm being facetious here, but let's, let's continue. Charge of the charge. system. Well, who puts, who, the, who, who puts them in charge? Was Lyndon Johnson white them, or black? Who put them in maybe charge? Well, help fine. Lyndon, Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson was white. Thank you. Okay. Sure, but Lyndon. but if your argument is that the reason he did it is because of racism, then no. I disagree. He did it because of... That's the... not my argument. I just asked you a simple question. Was he white or black? Charlemagne? And, you know... and no one said that. In other words, he's bringing up a point right here. This, again, this is a deflection here to focus on something that was never, ever said. It was never said. Uh, Mr. Elder, you said uh, you talked about the, the smash and grabs, right? And I mm-hmm. find that interesting because, you know, when you see the mass shootings that happen, majority of those people are white males. What do you what do you think about a- that? Actually, if you look at the percentage of, of whites in America, which is 60 percent, the percentage of mass shooters is under that. The percentage of people that commit hate crime is under that. The percentage of people who are serial killers is under that. Black people are 13 percent of the population. We commit a greater percentage compared to that. No, of you mass specifically shootings. talked about the smash and grabs, though. So I was saying, since you're using that as an example, I'm saying, well, what about you know the mass shooters that are usually one, white males? One, one, one more time, they they are usually white males because 60 percent of the country is 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 white. However, they are... now let me stop here because he's getting ready to make an absurd statement. One, he's saying that the reason why there are more mass shooters is because there are more white people. But let's also add that those, and and Charlemagne said this earlier, that most of the white shooters come from two parent homes, which has nothing to do with, in Larry's perspective, the majority of black people who come from single family homes, right? In other words, single mother homes, single mother homes. So, so, Larry's position is the mere absence of the father is why black people have higher crimes rates, have higher poor everything. So then the question is then, what do you do with crime? And you notice he's not talking about the crimes that white people commit. Now, so the, the point of th- that should be made here is, um, there is no correlation from Larry's perspective. There's no correlation that the mere absence of the fathers is why black people act out, right? There's no correlation to this. 
So this absurd uh, response that he's trying to, again, deflect that, well, there are more white people, so that's why. And what he's trying to say is that because there's more white people, the percentage decreases as opposed to when you look at the um, percentage of crime. Now, it should be noted, however, and this is where numbers come in at, if you're counting the black on black crime in black communities, you have to understand it is the high rate, and it is a high rate, in certain communities. So, for example, in Calabasas, where a lot of black celebrities live, a lot of black wealthy people live, Calabasas, California, there, is there a high black on black crime? Okay, let's not go that far. How about even when you talk about South Central, where Larry lived, I lived there, the high school we went to, you look at that area where there are high black on black, on black crime rate there. Now, if you go to the Southeast, what's called Watts, yeah, there was a higher black on black crime. So you had per probably per capita, more murders in a night. But it was in those areas. Now, if you want to say, let's count in the 13% of the black community, and then you want to say, let's go to the these black high crime areas. So then look about this. How about if I tell you what is the black on black crime rate in Wynn, Arkansas? I mentioned Wynn, Arkansas because I, I used to spend some of them in Arkansas. My grand grandmother is side of the family is from Wynn, Arkansas. So you go to Wynn, Arkansas, it's a small town um, where blacks live on one side of the on the one side of the tracks and whites live on the other side of the tracks. So what's so what is the the crime right there? And then we can multiply that all over rural America, where you have towns that have this black side of the town now. If, if if I read, listen to Larry, I should send every one of these towns, black people should be acting up. So the question becomes that in every one of these towns, right, can we say that there are, there is a 78% fatherless rate in these towns? And then, of course, do we overrepresent the crime rate in these towns. So where are these numbers coming from? And this is my point. The numbers come from uh, um, high population populated areas. So New York, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, Detroit, New Orleans, Atlanta, so forth and so on, where you have higher concentration of people, higher concentration of blacks. But again, even in these areas, you go to certain areas where you're going to see the higher black on black crime. Underrepresent in terms of the number of mass shootings. Uh, about 50% or so of the mass shootings in this country are committed by white people, even though white people are 60% of the population. They underrepresent. We overrepresent when it comes to hate crime, when it comes to mass shootings, when it comes to serial killings, when it comes to robberies, when it comes to virtually every category of violent crime. We overrepresent. So, what do white people do wrong? I'm going to keep asking. And then I'm going to say, did that represent you, Larry? Think about this. He said, he said we. So that means you're like that? The answer is no, of course. Well, you know, well you know, you, it, seem, it, seem, it, seems, it seems to me, rather than deal with, with what's going on, the pathology that's going on in the inner city, mm -hmm. you want to blame, you want me to talk about how bad white people are, which I don't think is a particularly, particularly productive thing to do. Well, I think that, I'm, no, I'm talking about cause. Now, I would say, let me push back on what he's saying now. On the one hand, he's correct, but no one's doing that. You came on the show. You started talking about the numbers. You started talking about um, your platform that you speak of is how bad black people are. Now, when you say productive, how are you being productive? Now, I'll ask a question. I'm, I'll leave it as a question because I don't know. In other words, what he's doing, uh, he, 
you know, is he reaching out to the inner city kid school? Is he providing schooling program for the inner city schools? Okay. But again, remember what we're talking about is in, in every kind of level of society, you have that the, the high crime uh, areas, the poor areas. And so in every situation, everyone, now he's going to talk about Asians later on. I could tell you, I worked for the, the Chicago Housing Authority, and they had a project housing for Asians. Now, did they represent any kind of significant number in terms of the Asians? No, but they're there. And within though in that area, you got crime that's going on. So my point is that his demonization of black people, that's disturbing because he's doing it, uh, speaking to white people, which has done well for him in life. It doesn't affect, but you know, if we can't talk about the cause, which I believe is systemic racism and white supremacy, the FBI says- that Well, I just one... told you, if it's systemic racism, please explain to me how it was when Americans America really had systemic racism in 1940. 87% mm. of blacks lived under the poverty line. Again, this is during uh, Jim Crow era. My father is from Athens, Georgia, grew up in Jim Crow. My mom is from Huntsville, Alabama, grew up in Jim Crow. 87% of blacks lived below the poverty line. This is before Brown versus Board of Education. Probably you, you did no not- choice. Now let's stop. Notice what he just said. So he picks one point. Um, and I don't think that 87% is accurate when he talked about living below the poverty line. But again, it's all it, it's it's all dependent upon where you count your numbers. Now they're gonna talk about the Wall Street, the Black Wall Street, the uh, Tulsa massacres in the nineteen twenties. So eighty seven percent of the people that in that lived in uh, that Greenwood section of Tulsa were not poor. Not eighty seven percent. There were the section of people that were poor. There were a section of people that were immoral, you could say, you know, prostitutes, what we may call promiscuous. But that was a thriving section of Tulsa. So you had businesses, you had um, a thriving communities, and you had people on all levels of the communities. And it, and and so and I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit here. But I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's important to understand what he's talking about. One of the problems, and I, I dealt with this before, when you talk about systematic racism, this is where Charlemagne is wrong because when you talk about systematic, the legalization of racism was done away with by the mid-1960s. So what system is he referring to? He cannot give an answer. Well, the answer is, is that though the system was done away with by the law, it did not change the heart and mind of some. So, for example, just a few years ago, uh, doing Donald Trump's um, term, and I believe it was 2018, you had a group of white men marched through Charlottesville, Virginia, right? And one of the things they was chanting was, the Jews will not replace us. Donald Trump got a lot of flack because he said there were very fine people on both sides, right? So but let's kind of go back. So he got this group of people carrying t uh, tiki tor torches, marching through, chanting. And when you look at the picture of the men, these were... They were the men that you would expect to see. A lot of them were dressed in collared shirts, button-down shirts. Some of them were lawyers. Some of them were cops. Some of them were hiring managers. Huh? Some of them, in other words, they kind of represented all levels of society. Different uh, professions. And yet, they were expressing some of the most vile racism. Now, here's my point. 
That's not systematic racism. They were racist, but they were not. The country itself is not. It's not. You can say the country produced them, but there's there was no legal systematic racism there. To, you can't say that that's what America was because America did away with systematic racism, constitutionally protected racism by the mid 1960s. So the racism you have today is when you look at that group of people that's carrying the tiki torches. When you look at that group of people, then you have to stop and say, now some of these people hire, they're hiring managers, right? With their view, their racist view, how do you think they would hire black people? How about police officers? What kind of justice would you would be administered by people who are carrying tiki torches, shouting the Jews, Jews will not replace us. So the point is, is that while we talk about systematic racism, I, I said this before that one of the best defense for black people to overcome the disparities in the judicial system, and there are. Now, why are there disparities because you have people like the very fine people marching through Charlottesville who can administer when you enter the judicial system and they will do it by the law. In other words, put it like this. If you have 10 white people doing 100 miles an hour down the street and you have one black person who is doing 100 miles an hour down the street, or freeway, okay? And then you have a cop, maybe he just came back, right? Maybe one of this white cop who comes back from marching in Charlottesville, Virginia. And he he sees 10 white people go by doing 100 miles an hour, and he doesn't turn his lights on until he sees the black person doing 100 miles an hour. He goes to pull over the, um, the black person and give them a ticket. Now, was that racist? Sure, it was racist. But more than it was racist, it was also legal. In other words, he operated within the law. He did not operate it within a legal systematic racism system. Now, the best way that you could then overcome that is you don't do 100 miles an hour. Don't speed. That's how you defeat that individual racism. And then you could say, let's now generate a movement, okay? Now you're gonna mention Black Lives Matter. Like, let's generate a movement to say, now we could charge individual police departments, police officers with racism because if they ignore white people speeding, and they do, and only targeted black people, that is racist. But it is also illegal to do so. Now my point is, the best way for black people to overcome the system is to not, in this case, don't speed. Don't do drugs, right? Don't speed and have expired license. Don't speed and have warrants out for you because now you 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 open the door. You It's a gift that you give racists a chance now to put you into the system. Now you come before a prosecutor. Let's say the prosecutor is racist. All right, the prosecutor is racist. But you open the door. Now it's going to be an entirely different thing if you're doing the speed limit and the cop pull you over. Call Al Sharpton. Call Ben Crump. That's what I would say. Here we go. Find, you did not find these kind of black on black crime. Probably because we had no but they still were living the, below the poverty line, though, sir. I'm sorry. You're forgetting the fact that they they were still living below the poverty line. You're picking and choosing, saying this was good, but this was bad. Okay. The bottom line, they end between the poverty line. Let, let me say one other thing about what he says about. Uh, but let's move. What he forward. says, um, what he says about um, hmm, okay, um, the racism. Uh, of the 40s versus the non-racism of the 80s. And he, he, he again, he mischaracterized, mischaracterized the situation. So, for example, let's take a small town. 
a small town in Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, uh, Virginia, Texas, Louisiana. Were there racism back then in those days? No, right? There was legal racism. I'm being I'm 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 being coy right here. I'm missing words. Why? But you didn't have a racial problem. What was their complaint when Martin Luther King started marching and other civil rights leaders? What was their complaint? These outside agitators stirring up the good negros. That was their complaint. Why? Because they, they, you didn't have a problem. Blacks stayed in their place. Now this idea were that now blacks were, you know, the family unit was intact. That's partially true, but within that side where blacks live in the black neighborhoods, again you had again a multi level um of people. You had working people, you had professional people, doctors, lawyers. You also had low-class people. You had people that were problematic, right? They were the bad people. They were the immoral people. Just like you had on the white side. On the white side of town, you had, you had whites that lived in trailer parks, and and they were unruly. They were um, um, just as um, committing criminal acts. Okay. Uh, and, and the criminal system, did, by the way, did treat them different. All right, here we go. Well, well let me, can I, can I just add, let me, can I just address that? In 1940, 87% of blacks lived under the poverty line. 1960, mm -hmm. that number had fallen to 47%. That's a 40 point drop in 20 years. That's the greatest 20 year period of economic expansion for black people in the history of America. Again, well before Brown versus Board of Education, well before the KKK uh, uh, imploded, uh, well before we had race based preferences. Why? Because it was rare for a black kid to be raised in a, in a family without a father in the home. Uh, a strong belief in Judeo-Christian values, a belief in patriotism, even as America wasn't applying these values to black people, obviously. Now, I'm going to stop here because I'll, I'll, I'll stop it and pick it up in part six. But what, what he's saying is this other nonsense. Now, notice he said that the reason why blacks were doing better um, during the 40s uh, is because there were fathers in the home. Again, that's just simply not true. Now, and, and let me be clear, so I won't get too far into this read. A family, an in, intact family, yes, father, mother, and then children. But what, what he's not saying about this is it's not just the presence of a father and mother. That father and mother has to then go a step further and teach their children, instruct their children, love their children. It's not just the fact that you have the presence of fathers. Because if that was the case, answer the question then, why most mass shooters come from two-parent homes? And of course, how are you now judging morality? See, if you say in this group, bad, like black people, but then in white people, we're going to ignore the immoral acts of white people. I mentioned this before, you go to college campuses. Are there immoral acts among college students? For example, spring break, for example, hazing, for example, parties, partying. What's going on in these parties, in, in these um, kids that come from two parent homes that can afford colleges? It's a matter of perspective. But I tell you what, I'm going to pick it up in part six and come back to what he is saying here. Um, and uh, so I'll pick this up in part six of Don't Bring Ignorance to a Debate, dissecting the Larry Elder's interview on The Breakfast Club. Now, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP The Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. See you in part six.